Chaba slams southern parts of Korea, claiming five lives and leaving five missing. South Korea and the European Union agree to come up with every possible measure to make North Korea give up its nuclear ambitions. And a former Portuguese prime minister is poised to become the next secretary general of the United Nations. These and more coming right up. Hello, it's Thursday, October 6th here in Seoul. Welcome to our newscast. I'm Hwang Ji-hae. Our top story this morning, five people are dead and five others missing after southern parts of Korea were battered by Typhoon Chaba on Wednesday. Among the three people who died in Busan, one construction worker was killed after a crane toppled over and another person died after falling from the roof of a building. Two others died in the city of Rusan, which was also slammed with torrential rain and strong winds. The General Insurance Association of Korea says the typhoon caused more than 9 million U.S. dollars in damages. Some homes were flooded and more than 1,600 vehicles were submerged. Around 230,000 homes suffered power outages and dozens of cultural properties were damaged. President Pakan has called for swift restoration efforts and response measures to minimize further damages. The storm, which has since been downgraded to a tropical depression, is currently affecting parts of Japan. We now enter the third day of the resumed parliamentary audit of the government that was halted last week due to a boycott by the ruling party. For more on the main talking points from Wednesday, Pak Ji-won reports. Wednesday's parliamentary audit session was given over to a series of corruption allegations surrounding the Mir and K Sports Foundations and the government's role in approving their establishment. Opposition lawmakers grilled officials from the related government agencies to get to the bottom of how the two relatively new foundations could have raised about 65 million U.S. dollars in donations in just about a month or two after their launch. The contributions were known to have come from several of the country's major conglomerates, but it's not known if there were any favors exchanged in the course of the foundation's establishment. The main opposition Minju party vowed to dig deeper into the allegations, pledging to keep investigating even after the audit wraps up on the 19th. The opposition parties also submitted a motion to the parliament secretariat Wednesday afternoon requesting an investigation by a special prosecutor into the case of an activist who died recently. The man had been in a coma for several months after having been knocked down by a police water cannon during an anti-government protest last November. The opposition parties are hoping to discover whether the police use of the water cannon was excessive or illegal and laid to rest any remaining controversies over the case. The proposal needs to win a parliamentary majority to succeed. If approved, the investigation could start sometime after the audit is finished. Meanwhile, ruling Senate Party leader Lee Jung-hyun, who is in the hospital after a week-long hunger strike sparked by a feud over the assembly speaker, is reportedly recovering quickly and could return to work as soon as next week. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. Also under the microscope at the parliamentary audit was the Korean economy. There, the finance ministry said much needs to be addressed in order to secure stronger growth. Shin Se-min tells us more. A diagnosis that continuous fluctuations in Korea's economic indicators may signal the country's economy is not on a stable path to recovery. According to a report submitted to the National Assembly for audit, the finance ministry said the country's economy is facing weak recovery momentum amid looming uncertainties at home and abroad, further weighed down by an unpredictable local financial market. Monthly figures also support that statement. Korea's exports dropped nearly 6 percent on year in September, backtracking from a long-awaited improvement the month before. 
The country's August current account surplus also fell to its lowest in the past four months. On the heels of dismal data, the finance ministry said it plans to continue with its expansionary fiscal policy to prop up the local economy after injecting an extra budget worth nearly 10 billion U.S. dollars. A nationwide shopping festival, dubbed Korea Sale Festa, which is currently underway, is also aimed at bolstering sagging consumer sentiment. To improve the country's growth capacity, the government rolled out detailed guidelines to enhance competitiveness in the sectors of steel and petrochemicals. It will also push forward with its ongoing corporate restructuring drive in the shipping and shipbuilding industries. In terms of the heavy household debt burden that zipped past $1.1 trillion as of the end of the second quarter, Korea's top economic policymaker was not too pessimistic. During the audit session, Finance Minister Yoel Ho said that although the size of household debt may be significant, quality-wise, it's not that bad. But he added that the ministry is working to devise additional means to curb the debt figures as tighter control on the loan-to-value and debt-to-income ratios does not seem to be sufficient in tackling further debt growth. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. South Korea and the European Union have vowed to work together in all aspects to end North Korea's nuclear program. At a conference held in Brussels Wednesday, Seoul's Foreign Minister Yoon Byung-hae and the EU's foreign policy chief Federica Mogherini agreed that North Korea's recent nuclear test highlighted the urgency of the regime's nuclear issue. They also pledged to cooperate in efforts to adopt stronger UN Security Council sanctions and implement them thoroughly. Minister Yoon expressed his appreciation for the EU's efforts regarding North Korea's provocations and asked for support through independent sanctions and diplomatic pressure. In return, Mogherini promised to actively consider specific measures targeting Pyongyang's nuclear capabilities. An official who played a key role in looking after North Korean leader Kim Jong-un's health reportedly fled the regime last month. If confirmed, it would be the latest in a series of high-profile defections from Pyongyang. Connie Kim has the details. A North Korean official stationed in Beijing has reportedly defected with his family. If confirmed, it would potentially provide further evidence of the growing instability within the regime. A source familiar with North Korea said the official from the public health ministry was responsible for purchasing medicine and medical equipment used for Kim Jong-un, his family and senior officials at the North's representative office in Beijing. The official reportedly fled with his wife and daughter late last month. Early reports on Wednesday seemed to suggest the official asked to defect to Japan, but Japan's foreign ministry has denied the news, saying it does not know of a North Korean hoping to seek asylum in the country. The source also said there is a need for further investigation into reports of the defection of another official from the same Beijing office. South Korea's unification ministry said it cannot confirm either of the defections. If confirmed, however, the defections would be surprising, especially given North Korea's close ties to China. In addition, there is growing speculation about how the officials could have escaped as Pyongyang installed a massive intelligence corps in China and Russia to keep tabs on officials stationed abroad after the defection of a North Korean diplomat from the UK over the summer. The presidential office of Changwada said it is monitoring the situation, considering the position of the defector in question. The reports of the defections have garnered even more attention after South Korean President Park Geun-hye, during a recent speech, invited ordinary North Koreans to make the journey south and find new hope. Connie Kim, Arirang News. Representatives of overseas Korean communities were in Seoul Wednesday for the annual celebration of World Korean Day. And they had a special speaker joining them, President Park Geun-hye. She pressed the need to instill a stronger sense of national pride and unity. Song ji reports. It's the 10th World Korean Day, an occasion to celebrate and encourage millions of Koreans living overseas. At the annual gathering, President Park Geun-hye showed her appreciation for the efforts of the more than 7 million Koreans who live in countries across the globe and pledged to help the country realize its potential through reforms and her creative economy drive. 
세계 경제가 갈수록 촘촘하게 연결되어 가는 상황에서 동포 여러분과의 협력은 우리 경제에도 무척 큰 힘이 되는 만큼 조국의 더큰 발전을 위해 힘을 모아주시기 바랍니다. 특히 우수한 역량을 갖춘 우리 청년들이 세계를 무대로 도전하고 꿈을 이루어 나갈 수 있도록 지혜와 경험을 나눠주시고 많은 기회를 열어 주실 것을 부탁드립니다. Saying that North Korea's obsession with its nuclear program will only lead to its own self-destruction, President Park said unification will enable overseas Koreans to freely travel across the peninsula and find long-lost family members separated by the war. 앞으로도 정부는 북한의 도발에 맞서 안보를 더욱 튼튼히 해 나가면서 동시에 평화 통일을 이루기 위한 노력을 멈추지 않을 것입니다. 북한 핵의 위협이 사라지고 평화 통일의 문이 열리면 한반도에 살고 있는 우리들 뿐만 아니라 720만 재외 동포 여러분과 세계 각국에도 새로운 행복과 번영의 기회가 열리게 될 것입니다. President Park asked the overseas Korean to play the role of independent diplomats and promote Seoul's North Korea policy while garnering international support for the denuclearization of the peninsula. Song Ji-sun, Arirang News. The UN Security Council has unanimously selected Antonio Guterres, the former Prime Minister of Portugal, as the next UN Secretary General. All that remains now is a formal Security Council vote set for Thursday morning local time. In a sixth closed-door ballot on Wednesday, Guterres received 13 encouraged votes and two no-opinion votes from the 15-member council. That's important as it means none of the five veto-wielding powers on the Security Council voted against him. Guterres is a former UN High Commissioner for Refugees and former Prime Minister of Portugal from 1995 to 2002. Once confirmed, he will replace Pan Ki-moon, who finishes his second five-year term at the end of December. In the latest sign of their deteriorating relations, Russia says it's halting cooperation with the United States in the nuclear energy sector. A suspension decree signed by Prime Minister Dmitry Medvedev was posted on the Russian government's website on Wednesday. It explained the decree was a countermeasure to Washington's violation of their agreement after the U.S. imposed sanctions on Russia for its role in the Ukraine conflict. The deal signed three years ago was aimed at jointly developing nuclear energy for peaceful purposes. The U.S. State Department says it has not received notification of the suspension but would regret Moscow's decision to scrap cooperation on what it believes is a very important issue. The suspension is due to come into effect 90 days after the U.S. delivers its response. A team of scientists from France, Scotland and the Netherlands has won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for their work on developing tiny machines that are a thousand times thinner than a strand of hair, or Oh Jung-hee reports. This year's Nobel Prize in Chemistry has been awarded to three chemists for their design and synthesis of the world's smallest machines. Jean-Pierre Sauvage, Fraser Stoddart and Bernard Feringa from France, Scotland and the Netherlands have developed molecules that can be linked together and controlled to form nanosized mechanical parts and generate energy. Dating back to the 1980s, Sauvage linked two tiny rings to create a molecular chain, Stoddart designed a ring on a molecular axle and Feringa designed the first molecular motor. The Nobel Committee said their chain discoveries could be used to develop new materials, sensors and energy storage systems. Uh, but one thing that will come for sure are smart materials, materials that you can change the properties, the size or their interaction with other things uh, when you shine light on them, for example. The prize winners commented that the award had not been anticipated and expressed excitement and expectations about grand applications likely to come in the future. I'm very surprised uh, and uh, I'm elated um, because of uh, my um, <clears throat> strong support that I've had from uh, a large number of uh, young scientists over the best part of 45 years. Uh, 
I don't know what to say, and I'm a bit shocked, you know, because it was such a, a great surprise. And then my second remark was, I'm so honored, and uh, I'm also emotional about this. The three scientists will share the prize money of almost 930,000 U.S. dollars and will receive their medals and diplomas at the award ceremonies in Stockholm in December. Oh Jung-hee, Arirang News. And that wraps it up for now. I'm Hong Jie. Thank you for staying with us. And I'll be back in less than two hours for more news updates. And goodbye for now.